So I think this is a big deal, but it's an evolution, not a revolution in terms of the product. It's incrementally better, about you know 20% more energy density, going from 3.9 megawatt hours per megapack to five. So that's pretty impressive. I think the big thing is the mega block that they're calling it. That's the transformer and the switch gear all in one. You've got the bus bars, which removes a lot of the cabling and a lot of the on-site assembly. Just doing a lot of smart things to simplify processes, take out, but this goes back to what Elon has done for so long. It's like the best part is no part. Just figure out what you're doing with any particular process, remove some of that stuff out of there and make a better, more streamlined process. There's a lot of nice things about this, but I don't think it's a fundamentally a significantly different architecture than what they had in the past. It's just smoother, better, slightly more performant. I want to maybe come back to the data center part in a little bit. I was just at a conference at the intersection of data centers, AI and energy and how those fit together. So I've got a lot to talk about on that, but I want to make sure to get Jordan's insights here first. But then the last thing I think I'd say is you said, why does this matter to Tesla and why are people underestimating it? And it's 50 extra gigawatt hours. They're going to be close to a run rate of 200 gigawatt hours between all their different sites, probably by the end of next year, when this goes live, it's going to take a while to ramp up to that level, but at 200 gigawatt hours and let's just say $250 per kilowatt hour average price, maybe that comes down over time, but you're talking about $50 billion in revenue from the energy side which is a big deal. This is growing really quickly at decent gross margins. By what year do they expect to hit the 50 billion? And the 50 billion is my number. Take it with a grain of salt. They said in the presentation, they were talking about the Houston site being like starting production by end of next year. So let's say it takes a while for them to ramp up to the full 50 gigawatt hours. Let's call it mid 27 or something like that, where they're at that 200 gigawatt hour run rate annually at $50 billion. And let's just say a 20% gross margin, even that's $10 billion of gross margin annually and growing very rapidly. So it starts to become very meaningful, but I've monologued for too long. So I'm curious, Jordan's thoughts on this. Go for it, Jordan. Matt's summary is great. So I'm just going to be restating it in a different way and giving my flavor on it. A good analogy would be the progression from the Powerwall 2 to the Powerwall 3. They're integrating more and making it more deployable. So you have a product that's more easily scalable and it's also lower cost because they're making it higher energy density and fitting more into each one of these. These So it's Tesla's total addressable market for the mega pack was already absolutely massive. But as usual, they're continuing to pr improve their products to make sure that they stay at the head of the market. I would say this keeps Tesla at the head of the pack for another three to five years. Okay, just make sure I understand the density portion of this new product is it just stuffing more batteries in the same form factor? Is it improving cooling? Is it different chemistry? How are they increasing the energy density? As far as I can tell, I have to rewatch the presentation. I've watched it once, but it's probably worth two, two passes because there was a lot of subtle information in there. But it sounds like they're moving to larger battery cells, and that helps them pack more into each one of those mega packs. As Matt indicated, they're simplifying the connections between the mega packs and the switchgear and transformer that comes along with that product. So it's a lot easier to assemble. There's less parts, less components that automatically reduces your weight and may have had some impact on the fact that they can fit 25% more energy in each one of these. And I think they also said part of the reason why they s selected this size is because if they go too much bigger, then they can't throw one of these on the back of a truck. So they have to stick to that form factor. So what I've heard thus far is that Tesla is taking steps to figure out how to get their products to scale as fast as possible to the largest possible number in the long term. And they're creating these processes or steps or changes to their product to get to that point. In the wake of the massive energy needs that are very obvious that are going to come from artificial intelligence deregulation like one of the big things we talked about last time was co-locating a lot of these energy generation systems with these ai training clusters they're building there's a lot of loosening of regulations to get companies to have their own essentially essentially power plant next to the thing that they're trying to do ai is a huge driver of that it seems like anybody could do that which is going to drive towards decentralization of energy generation potentially and energy storage so is this tesla's attempt to bring that future faster and capitalize on that trend or is this just a natural 
step Tesla would have taken anyway. Is this a response to what is happening with artificial intelligence? Or was this a natural stepping stone for where we were going from an energy perspective? Matt, maybe you're better equipped to answer this, but you tell me. Yeah, I don't think those are necessarily mutually exclusive answers. Tesla probably would have done steps like this in general, just because they, they always have this constant improvement mindset with all their products. I think what's really clear for anyone who's watching this space is just how enormous the energy demands from the data centers is becoming. So I alluded to this before. I just got back from a conference that was called Yada 2025, and they're basically talking about how do we get to Yada watts or Yada bytes of compute in the longer term. It was super interesting because... You had representatives from Oracle, Microsoft, OpenAI, all these hyperscalers talking about their plans and how they're dealing with the energy shortage, as well as what they're seeing on the AI side. My overall takeaway is they have very aggressive CapEx assumptions and build out plans because of how much demand they, they thought they were going to have. And pretty much all of them were saying, we actually need even more than our <laughs> previously aggressive plan. What used to be the bottleneck a couple of years ago, which was chip manufacturing, now, very clearly, the bottleneck for more deployment is energy. So there's the generation piece, energy generation, which is super key. But since we're talking about megapacks, I'll talk about one part of the way that data centers operate, which is uh, really tricky. And that's the load profile of these data centers is extremely wonky. So one of the guys there was talking about how you might have a one gigawatt data center, but on average, it's only going to be using, it, uh, it's going to only be about two thirds utilized. But with the way that these computations are running, it's extremely hard to manage these swings. It'll go from full load to dropping instantaneously by very significant amounts. And that's not such a big deal when you're a 50 megawatt data center. But if you're like a two gigawatt data center, you literally can't do that to the grid. You'll break stuff. The guys from OpenAI were talking about how on-site generation is essentially a must right now. Having some way to buffer these wild swings in a very short period of time is extremely important. I think Megapack has a part to play there. The inverters they have are extremely valuable, managing multiple different generation types, including the grid, a uh, constant output. But I think you might even need more like super capacitors and things like that to handle this. OpenAI was basically just saying, you want to actually architect this where you've got storage as close to the chips as possible. So while I think Megapack is going to be part of this overall solution. There's a lot more parts too. Overall, I think all ships are going to rise because there's so much demand for power and energy storage that if you're just playing in the space at all, I think you'll probably do pretty well. And just to clarify for the audience that may not understand why a storage, a battery storage thing would make sense, the battery storage is significantly more capable at dumping power at a moment's notice than a grid would because a grid needs to spool up. And then the opposite is true also. Whenever there is a, no longer a instant need for the power, the battery storage can immediately cut that off, whereas the grid would have to spool down. Is that a fair... Representation. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd say that the grid is extremely capable of ramping up and down, but when you start talking about the scale right now, we're talking about gigawatt scale data centers, but a lot of the presenters that I was just at this conference with were talking about, all right, five years from now, we're going to be talking about 20, 30 gigawatt data centers. The benefits from scale in this space are just so enormous. Uh, that's the way this is going. You'll break stuff on the grid. Your local substation can't handle regular gigawatt swings. It's not even just the power. It's the voltage draw and the inertia from these turbines. When you flip on a switch, you're actually increasing the resistance on these spinning masses, um, like a gas turbine or a steam turbine. If you are very significantly and regularly jerking these machines that are all uh, connected to the grid, you, you're increasing the probability mm. that you're going to break things. It's just not a viable solution to be putting those massive swings onto the grid. You're going to need some ability to absorb those instantaneous swings locally. It's if you're mowing the lawn and you hit a really tall patch and your mower goes, Rrr. that's literally uh. what's happening with these things. There is physical resistance when you put a load on the grid. It's like a lawnmower hitting a tall patch of grass. And if it gets so bad, the lawnmower turns off. And it Got also it. places stresses on all the transistors and all the other electronics that need to operate within these tight bounds. It's like when you put a heavy load on your power in your house and the lights dim, that's actually hard on your computer and all the other electronics. So you need a buffer there to protect everything else as primary need. Okay, got it. That makes sense. Wow. So the battery obviously is going to be much better equipped to do that because it's just a battery. It'll just dump the power. You don't have any mechanical pieces per se. It's just like, okay, here's the power you need. You just need enough batteries close enough on site to be able to deliver that power 
on and off whenever is needed. And that's why something like this would make so much sense long term. Okay. One of the things that I'm hearing is that the need for compute is not going to be as big as you think it's going to be because the the algorithms are going to get much better or the neural nets, whatever the processes are going to employ is going to massively reduce the need for so many chips to draw power. And then on top of that, there's going to be new chips that are going to be more efficient, that they're not going to draw nearly as much power. And so all these needs for power are vastly overblown because you actually not going to need that much as much as you think, because the improvements in the technology are going to outweigh those needs. How do you reconcile that? I don't think that's actually the case. I think there's one thing saying that the current bottleneck is chips or energy, but if you're looking longer term, whenever Tesla ramps a vehicle, you have to ramp all this AI infrastructure and you're going to be playing whack-a-mole with a hundred different challenges. As these chips get more efficient, they're going to be more economic to produce useful work. So the demand for them is going to increase. The reduction in cost and increase in inf efficiency over time will also increase the demand for chips. There's a lot of debate over whether chips are going to be the bottleneck over different time periods or whether it's going to be energy. In my view, it's going to be one or the other intermittently because each is going to hit their scaling ramps and the other one's going to catch up. So you have these two different exponential curves that you have to deal with when you're ramping it. Matt, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, there's a name for the paradox on this question that I'm blanking on right now, but this is something Jensen Wong was talking about when DeepSeek came out and it was like 90% more efficient. It's like, oh my gosh, maybe we don't need all these NVIDIA GPUs. And you saw the stock like drop significantly. Um, but what Jensen was saying and what I've been hearing over and over again is exactly what Jordan just said. If you reduce, let's just say you, you make these chips 10x more efficient, which is like essentially what they're trying to do every single generation is 10x the efficiency. Okay, that lowers the cost per token. And that means you can get much better answers for the same amount of power input, which is going to translate directly into more demand. And Those oh, paradox. Thank you. You can Google. That's good. <laughs> So I think what all these hyperscalers are seeing is that you're seeing these efficiency gains, which is making real strides in lowering the overall cost, but that is being outstripped by the increase in demand from users. Anecdotally, it seems to me that we're still in the early phases of adoption. I know a lot of people who don't use any AI tools in their work or daily life. And as I'm using these more and more and like getting better answers, I'm using ChatGPT's deep research more because it's giving me better answers. Then as I'm getting those better answers, that opens this other little wormhole down here that I want to start going down. Uh, I absolutely believe that because these are delivering so much value, as the costs go down, you'll have a more than offsetting increase in demand. I agree with that for sure. What's fascinating about that is digital space. We're not even talking about embodied AI and the needs that's going to have from a training perspective, the human or robots, like the Optimus bot is what we talk about a lot on the channel. And then what other form factors of embodied AI are going to exist in the future? I highly doubt we're going to stop at the human form factor. We're going to have many other use cases for embodied AI. Digital AI is going to continue going through a massive sort of moment of gaining more and more intelligence, which is going to create more and more need for compute. Is there going to be a point where the training side of the equation is going to hit a limit where these battery systems are no longer going to be as valuable as we thought much sooner than we expect, and it all shifts over to inference? Inference is not going to really need much from a mega cluster, or maybe it does. Let me reframe the question. Is this need for energy where battery storage, specifically things like the mega block and the mega pack could vastly benefit from. Is this a training compute only thing or is this an AI period thing? Is it both training and inference? Any AI needs this sort of co-located battery thing. Does that even make any sense? I'm scripting on this at the moment for one of my upcoming videos. I think what you're talking about is there's going to be, currently we need these massive data centers for training AI. Over time, we're going to need more inference compute. So we're going to need a lot more inference compute over time. And that's true. And that's part of the reason why Tesla set aside their dojo program. If training is only going to be 5% of your total compute, why would you invest all this money into that? Why not just use their current inference chip and make it good at training rather than having a dedicated project towards that? You have the training compute, which is better centralized, and you have the inference compute, which also currently tends to be centralized. 
However, over time, a lot of that inference compute is going to be pushed out to the edge in robo taxis and robots and things like that. So you're ultimately, it could be that these centralized, at least I took a wild stab at it. Currently, the amount of compute people have in their homes and devices in terms of power compared to the amount of compute in data centers is like three to one. So if Elon wants to build one terawatt of- Who's got the three? I'll explain it here in a moment. If you have, Elon wants to do one terawatt of compute. If you do that three to one split, maybe only 250 gigawatts of that one terawatt would be centralized training and the rest would be pushed out to the edge. For example, if you have 4 billion Optimus robots and each one needs 250 watts, there's your terawatt right there. That doesn't imply that the needs from a training perspective are going to go down. If anything, it probably means that the training is going to be increased because there's going to be such a massive need for the inference to work on the edge. It's going to have less of a slice of the pie, but the pie is going to grow by hundreds yeah. of orders of magnitude. Multiples. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Got it.